I'm Rebecca Chow, and I'm one of the co-founders of the volunteer initiative called Harass Map, and we're an Egyptian initiative made up of just normal people uh, who do this work in the afternoons and weekends after our normal jobs. Uh, I'm American. I moved to Cairo in 2004 because I wanted to work for a local NGO somewhere in the world, and I just wanted to find out what it was like what was going on, how things worked. And so by chance, completely, I found one in Cairo that agreed to hire me for six months. And so I went and eight years later, I am still there and I'm still learning and I'm still meeting amazing people, including my husband. And uh, you know, it, Cairo has become my home. So like every place, I'm also learning that there is a mix of good things and bad things. And sexual harassment is one of those things that I learned would be a daily challenge for me and a lot of the people that I know. So as an example, uh, let me tell you about a story that happened to me. I was meeting a friend one day after work. Uh, I took the metro and I was waiting for him on a busy street in a nice part of town. It was daylight, it was rush hour, there were lots of cars parked uh, waiting in traffic and lots of men and women standing there waiting for taxis or buses. Suddenly, I had the feeling that something was wrong. I looked up and I saw a man staring at me intensely. I immediately looked down, but when I looked up again, he was still staring. And then I noticed that he had his pants open and he was exposing himself and touching himself. And as he walked by me back and forth, I couldn't believe my eyes. <laughs> I, he walked back and forth in front of me four or five times and he was getting closer and touching himself the whole time. And I was completely shocked. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I checked myself, uh, my long loose clothes were fine, and so I thought someone from the crowd, surely someone would do something soon. Uh, they could all see him, and uh, someone would speak up and tell him to stop or chase him away. But I looked around and no one seemed to even notice. Or worse, some were looking at me in disgust. It was scary. Um, it made me feel like if this was happening, then anything could happen to me right here in public and no one would even notice. When I got in the car, I told my friend what happened. And it's not that he didn't care. He was upset too. And he and the other friends that I told responded by telling me, I should have done this or I should have done that. I should have dressed differently. I should stand differently. I should not be on the street in the first place. I heard a lot of reasons for why I had caused this to happen, and a lot of reasons that the harasser was powerless to resist. And at the beginning, to be honest, I accepted this. I'm embarrassed to say, <laughs> but I did. Maybe there were reasons that it was my fault. It would almost be a relief if that were true. If we could only find the key, the answer, maybe we could solve it ourselves. Over the next years, I started collecting stories. My own stories, my friends, my colleagues, my family, friends of friends, friends of friends of friends, complete strangers, to see if all of us were doing the same thing, if we were causing this to happen to ourselves. Even though, the, even though harassment was hard to talk about at that time, almost every, everyone we talked to had a story. And here are some of the reasons I heard the most. So reason one, I am harassed because I'm foreign. Okay, that's true, I am foreign. And harassment and violent attacks of foreign women, especially journalists, make the news. But Naveen isn't foreign. And she was nine months pregnant when she was followed by a harasser in a BMW. He was shouting explicit comments about what he would do to her and following her and swerving with the car as if to hit her. And what about those women attacked by the mob in downtown Cairo in 2006? They weren't foreign. Nor were the almost 10,000 women whose stories we collected in multiple surveys over the last years. 
this isn't only happening to foreign women. Reason two, I'm harassed because I'm not veiled. But Yusra is veiled. She was held against a wall and groped all over her body by 10-year-old boys. In one study, 72% of women who were harassed were veiled. That's about the same as the general population. Most of the harassment scandals that we saw in the news were veiled women wearing abayas, the long black dress. Um, from the street in front of the cinema in 2006 until the blue bra girl in Tahrir. Uh, one f one, in fact, one of my veiled friends actually uh, stopped wearing her long, loose skirts that come to the ground uh, and started wearing pants, even though she thinks it's wrong to, to wear pants, because she gets harassed less in jeans. And some women we know who wear the niqab, which is the full face and body veil, the black one that covers everything, they say even that they get harassed more after they started wearing the niqab. So a veil doesn't really seem to matter. So reason number three, I'm harassed because the bad economic situation is preventing young men from getting married. And because they're religious, they can't have premarital sex, causing them to harass women. So, Noha uh, was molested by her middle-aged married doctor. He wasn't facing a bad economic situation, and nor were those guys in the BMW. Even more strange, 8% of the reports received by Harassma, the harasser was a child clearly not suffering from sexual frustration <laughs> or delayed marriage. And no religion, not mine nor any that I know of, tolerates this kind of behavior. These three reasons surfaced over and over again in various combinations and forms, despite the fact that they contradict the obvious evidence. As if to say, there's no larger problem. The problem is individual girls who are bringing it upon themselves. Together, my friends and I call these the veil your lollipop argument, after this ad that circulated around 2007. It's saying that men, who are the flies here, <laughs> can't be stopped, uh, but the victims, the lollipops, <laughs> can protect ourselves by covering our heads. In other words, the problem of harassment would be solved if only the victim would change her behavior. We, the harassment volunteers, don't believe this is true at all. We believe that the only way this problem will stop is if all the harassers stop harassing. And the only way they'll stop is if we stop accepting these reasons. Stop ignoring, stop making excuses for them, and stop tolerating their behavior. And of course, that's how it used to be in Egypt not so long ago. People in neighborhoods intervened to keep their streets safe. Harassers were even chased and caught sometimes by bystanders who would shave their heads as a mark of shame. My friends who have shaved heads even joke about it today. <laughs> they get teased in, in cafes. And even five years ago, my male friends say that it was less acceptable to be a harasser. Now people, even including police, don't give it a second thought. It's even sometimes cool or manly or funny. We are reminded of what those old days felt like in the first 18 days of the revolution, when what had become a plague of harassment suddenly, mysteriously, and magically disappeared, almost, uh, <laughs> with no new law, no police, and nothing except a renewed sense of communal pride and responsibility. So how do we restore Egypt's tradition of standing up to harassers? In 2009, I heard about you Shahidi and Frontline SMS, which makes it possible for anyone to send a report by a mobile phone or online, which then gets mapped and published online anonymously. And at that time, 97% of the Egyptian population owned a mobile phone, and half of those were women. Now it's over 100%. I thought the potential was too good to pass up. Uh, and since the NGOs at that time were only interested in working on advocacy for a new law, I put together four co-founders and tech partners to develop HarassMap as an independent group of volunteers. 
We designed the program to address the issues that we felt formed the worst parts of our own experiences, and those are the women we talked to, by using the online technology to support a huge offline community mobilization effort. So online, an anonymous reporting and mapping system lets us safely document harassment, addressing the feeling of isolation and giving a voice to those who would otherwise hesitate to speak. Offline, each report receives an auto-response telling people how to access free services offered by NGOs to victims, help with legal aid, getting a lawyer, making a police report, psychological counseling, self-defense classes. These were all being offered for free, but few people knew how to access them. Online, the map, which is at harassmap.org, um, marked each incident with a red dot and you can click on each red dot and see the actual text of the report. And this helps us to break stereotypes, sometimes even our own stereotypes, uh, that lead to inaction. So stereotypes like it only happens in cities, or it only happens in rich areas, or it only happens in poor areas, or in dark alleyways, or to veiled women, or to not veiled women, or foreigners, or even only to girls. Offline, the community outreach teams use printouts of the map zoomed in on their neighborhood to demonstrate that harassment is a problem that exists even in their own community. Most importantly, we use the community outreach teams to tackle the veil your lollipop problem, ignoring it or blaming the victim while making excuses for the harasser. To do this, our volunteers, who are now about 500, uh, 500 men and women, about half and half, from all over Egypt, go into their own neighborhood streets once per month to target people who have a presence in the street. Shop owners, police, the guys that are standing there parking the cars, doormen, anyone who has a presence and is always around, because these people have the ability to change the atmosphere in the streets. They can set what's accepted and what's not accepted. Our volunteers are trained to respectfully and factually answer their questions and remind them of the old Egypt. Speaking to them as neighbors and friends, they ask them to stand against harassment by being watchful guardians and telling harassers to stop. If they agree, they can make their area a safe area and we give them a sticker and we post their location on our website. The sticker identifies their shop or area as, as a safe zone and we post our information online so people can look up the, the safe areas and patronize those shops. Using this face-to-face -face outreach, together with a public campaign, we hope to change the social acceptability of sexual harassment and re-establish consequences for harassers. So, how is the world getting better? <laughs> Our outreach teams report that about 8 out of 10 of the people that they talk to in the street agree by the end of the conversation to guard their neighborhood against harassers. This is really great, but what makes us feel really hopeful is that every day we're getting more and more volunteers who contact us because they want to take action. They no longer feel it's okay to stand by and wait for someone else to do something about this problem. So we try to motivate men and women of all ages and all backgrounds from all over Egypt to send us their ideas. And we support them and we try to work together with them to implement their ideas together as a, as a society. It's not easy <laughs> to go up to complete strangers on the street and talk to them about sexual harassment. <laughs> um, but we have so many groups and people, individuals, who want to get trained to do that, that as volunteers ourselves, we find we can't meet the demand. There are people and organizations waiting for us to work with them in 300 public schools, public transportation, in six slum areas. One of our volunteers from a neighborhood in Cairo called Mbebe told us her mom regularly meets with older women in her mosque and talks to them about how they can talk to their sons and daughters about the problem, completely on her own. It's amazing. Teams in rural governorates outside of Egypt are printing their own materials from our designs and using the online guide that we posted for people, and they go into the streets even before we can train them. People who stood up to harassers 
are telling us their stories, and we're collecting them so we can publish them as role models to encourage other people to do the same thing. Volunteers are participating in blogging and tweeting days to encourage victims to speak out. We use the NSH hashtag along with lots of other volunteers and organizations, and uh, we're also trying to run a, a YouTube video competition. Um, we're working with other groups on an art exhibition, live performances of our reports, an open mic, anti-harassment graffiti campaigns, and a uh, selesl, which is a, a human chain of people that stand on busy streets and hold signs with messages against harassment. A volunteer donated our SMS shortcode, so it's much easier to remember the number to make reports. Uh, another volunteer is setting up a voice system so that we can take reports by, by voicemail and it doesn't depend on writing, um, which is great if you've ever been harassed and you don't want to stop in the middle of the street in front of your harasser and type out an SMS message. Uh, we all talk about stopping harassers on TV and radio and to print journalists. And hundreds of people, some of them groups of friends and some of them individuals, have gotten in touch with us to join us or to tell us about their own initiatives. We've even heard from activists in 15 other countries. And although our hands are so full with our work at home, we try to coach them by Skype. And we send them a questionnaire that helps them think through the most effective ways to work in their country and connect them to the tech experts that can help them set up a system and connect them to each other and answer their questions. And out of the 15 countries, four have already launched, Yemen, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Palestine. Um, so, so today, when a big harassment scandal hits the news, there are fewer people giving reasons. And every day, more and more people are taking action with us or on their own. And person by person, they're all getting us closer to the day when we'll reach a tipping point in our streets and harassers will no longer be tolerated. So that's why we feel the world is getting better. Thank you.